My name is Hannah Conchu and I'm a grain farmer in southern Alberta and we are trying our best to manage resistant wild oats. Uh, hi, I'm Josh Slade. I uh, originate from Australia, grew up on a mixed farm on Kangaroo Island in South Australia. Ended up over here at, with the Weeb family here. I, now I farm with um, John and Janice Weeb along with his son Raiden and his wife Jen and my wife Jeannie now. So. My name is Kendall Heisey. Uh, my wife and I farm at Isabella, Manitoba, which is in the western part of the province. Uh, we grow uh, two different types of wheat, canola, faba beans and soybeans. So we, we started to notice a few spots in our fields where the wild oats would make it all the way to harvest and set seed and it became uh, to be a little bit suspicious. So we, we actually started to, to test them before we would get in there and harvest. So I collected the seeds and sent them away for testing and that's how we confirmed that we first had a bit of resistance. So the value of, of monitoring comes back to being able to, to manage what you monitor. So if you know what you're dealing with in the field, you can then make decisions that allow you to best sort of work around that issue. And it definitely, it's, it's definitely worth the, you know, the few hundred dollars to run some tests and then be able to, to go from there. My first real opener with herbicide resistance on this farm was in, I remember it clearly, 2013. So we thought, okay, let's double pass it. We went out with a clethodim type product, sprayed it. And I remember coming back about 10 days later and just noticing all these green patches throughout the field. And, but oh no, that's, that doesn't look too good. Did some resistance testing and realized that we had some pretty significant group one resistance going on. So that was, that was my first real opener there. Um, so obviously seen plenty of resistant weeds in Australia, but coming here, I was always told that the snow froze them off. There's no such thing. That was when one of the stories I remember hearing in about 2010, 11, but obviously that's not the case. Otherwise we wouldn't be here talking. In 2003, I, I rented a, a new parcel of land and uh, planted it to uh, field peas. Um, I used, uh, uh, I believe it would be Centurion or Group 1 uh, herbicide, uh, along with a lighter rate of pursuit for uh, broadleaf control. And I, I noticed patches in the field that weren't controlled at all, patches of wild oats. Um, they were all fairly irregular shaped and kind of my, my worst fear. Um, went out and investigated further and I, I couldn't see any evidence of uh, group one activity on the wild oats, not the characteristic pinching of the leaves or the lack of unrolling of the, uh, of the sheath, but I was seeing some group two injury from the pursuit. So that was my first clue as to they were resistant to the group one, uh, but were susceptible to other products. So far, because we started testing and, and trying to manage the issue before it got you know too out of control I would say the impact has been minimal but if you think about it the way that wild oats can capture all the moisture and the nutrients that you want available for your growing crop it can turn into something um, pretty drastic pretty quickly and especially if, if you have to then take more changes in your management I guess so it's definitely something that it pays to get on sooner than later so um, even based on those two years of testing that we've done and then the decisions that we've made or the herbicide groups that we've rotated out after, um, this year we're showing pretty pretty decent efficacy of our um, wild oats issues. So it gets expensive though, you know, you're talking 30, 40, 50 bucks an acre in some cases to get these weeds under control. And I can speak firsthand now that we, it's gone full circle for us now on that field I spoke about earlier. We've gone back to Clearfield Canola on it. There's literally hardly any wild oats there now. We, but that's been seven, eight years of trifluralin, Avidex, at least two active modes of action on that wild oat. And we've, we've kind of got it under control, but it's been expensive. And also it brings about diversification too. You know, some of these crops that we are growing may not pencil out like canola does. Well, like I mentioned, I was fortunate I caught it early and I had some management techniques that were able to keep it under control. Unfortunately, if the, uh, uh, while oats had taken over the complete field, uh, more drastic measures had have to be taken, whether seeding down to a forage for a number of years to to run the viability of the seed out in the seed bank uh, um, before going back to, to an annual crop. But for myself, uh, I had enough management techniques available that I was able to continue pretty much business as usual, but just pay extra special attention to that one particular field.
So we'll keep up with the testing. That's something that we'll keep doing every year. So if I find, uh, you know, it's harvest time and I go out and I see wild oats that are clearly, you know, towering above the crop and, and ready to drop their seeds everywhere, we'll keep the testing up. Um, we've, of course, rotated away from those herbicide groups that we are showing a bit of resistance to, even if it's not a large percentage of resistance, just to, um, yeah, just to try to sort of combat that issue. So we're also thinking of um, looking into ways that we can start uh, try to implement the group 8 herbicides uh, into our, our system. That's something that we haven't done because we typically those products are granular and you have to do some sort of soil disturbance. So because we're so dry, that's something that we haven't tried yet, but it, it is, it's definitely on our radar. The amount of nutrients and water even a one leaf wild oat removes from the soil or your crop is, it, it's insane. So I can't stress the, the importance of getting a residual layer down if on problematic fields or problematic patches just to get the population down. And then grow that good cultivar, grow a good crop, good competitive crop, high seeding rates, compete, and then get in there with that early in-crop spray. Well, the, the main thing is to identify these patches, uh, and they're mostly irregular shaped. They don't line up with sprayer misses. They don't line up with, with anything else. They're very oddly shaped, and, and so you can, I identify them, but in, in terms of, of dealing with the, uh, the resistant wild oats, it's important that I uh, do as little disturbance to the soil as possible. And I was already into direct seeding, uh, so that fit well into the management, uh, just a one pass seeding system. Uh, so I disturbed the, uh, as little of the soil as possible so as not to wake up the, the resistant wild oats and, and again, hopefully run the viability out of, uh, out of the seed bank um, before they had the right conditions to, uh, to germinate. So in terms of our seeding management practices and how we're using that to manage wild oats, we've actually reduced our spacing down from 14, in to, from 14 inches down to 12. And we're always trying to make sure that our, our seeding rate is at the higher end of the recommended rate, because that of course always helps with um, plant and weed competition. So those are a couple things that we're doing to try to manage weeds that way as well. Well, let's say our average chemical bill might be 25 or 30 bucks an acre. So you're gonna go and add 20 just to go and get these weeds under control. When some years you might be looking at 50 or 60 bucks an acre profit, like that's a fair percentage of your profit going out on those acres. But the reality is, is that if we don't do it and we just keep losing chemical modes of action and we're forced into some strategies that maybe we don't want to do, you know, maybe some heavy tillage or harvest weed seed control, which is I'm a massive advocate for. We've got four of these machines behind me and they're all fitted with seed terminators. So, and that's expensive too, you know, but we're just trying to just stay ahead of the curb, you know, listen to research, listen to the scientists listen to other places in the world, you know, and just try, just try and do a little bit, you know, just don't, don't hang back and just think there's going to be a silver bullet because I don't think there's going to be. Last of all, not that it's probably the most important, but good record keeping. Uh, when I first had the problem, we didn't have a lot of the uh, pull off the shelf data management systems where you could, uh, everything was stored for you automatically and you go back and you could see what was sprayed. So I've been using a spreadsheet for probably about 25 years for every crop I've grown and every herbicide I've used and, and the groups. And, and that's, that's really important. You can go periodically, I go back and see whether I'm trending to one group or another and, and try and mix things up a little bit. Continued research when it comes to wild oats resistance, it's so important. And I, I always come back to something that Eric Johnson said from the U of S and that's that you're never gonna be able to spray your way out of a, a wild oats resistance issue. So being able to you know, fund that research that's looking at different modes of action, different cultural practices, the way that you see those sorts of things. Um, it's, yeah, it's super important to be able to, to keep that going because eventually we are gonna run out of herbicide groups that we can use, so super important. You know, it's, it's vitally important. Look, that's, that's what we need, you know. It's hard for farmers to go and do their own trials. It's busy enough just trying to get crop in and the crop off so yeah I think the investment is absolutely critical to the to the success of us and the success of us managing these weeds. Well I think it's extremely important uh, to continue to fund research uh, 
the thing that goes along with the research is the publication of the research and you have a broader audience that it gets to. Um, for myself, doing what I did on my farm, uh, my neighbors knew what I was doing. Uh, a few people close around knew what I was doing, uh, but the broader audience didn't. And I think that's why it's so important to continue with research to, uh, to help with the awareness and also to uh, possibly help with uh, future development of different modes of action of herbicides. If we better understand how the wild oats became resistant to the herbicide groups they did, perhaps that will help uh, herbicide companies focus in a different direction. Mm -hmm.